GDG Cloud Boston and GDG Atlanta are pleased to present a professional cloud database engineer certification workshop. This is formal session number three of a 12-week series. And your hosts are Norbert Kramer in Boston, Jessica Rudd in Atlanta. You can read more about us on the registration page. I won't go into our bio sketch as we've done that before. Um, all of our meetings at GDG events are covered by a code of conduct. The spirit of that is very simple. It's just be kind, uh, collaborate, and participate to the extent that you're able to and willing to. And the formal version of that is here as a document, but um, it's pretty straightforward. And let's go into uh, this evening's content. So we'll have a quick overview of where we are in our <clears throat> learning path. Uh, this week, we will review content for two uh, courses that are all labs, OK? So they were labs covering MySQL, labs covering PostgreSQL or Postgres. And then we'll, um, depending on time, how things go, we'll have some sample question review. We'll have a bit of a bit of a Q, we'll leave a little bit of time at the end for Q and A, any questions. And then we'll have a look forward to the next two weeks or the next week especially. So with that, let's have a look at this. We've, um, ah, a couple of housekeeping notes first. Um, I've been, posting the recordings up to YouTube as quickly as I can. Uh, got a little bit behind in the 4th of July week, so we're caught up now. And uh, what I'm doing now is if you go to the registration site for our meetings in Bevy, uh, the uh, YouTube recording will be posted there as a, a, a so-called featured video, right? It's a featured video of the event. Now that's, at the moment, that's true only if you go to the GDG Cloud Boston site. I don't know if that will be carried over to the uh, co-hosting sites, but we can probably arrange for that. We'll also continue to put the links into Slack, but we're using a free version of Slack, so everything will scroll off after 90 days and this slack content that we're putting there now will will be lost fairly quickly so if you see anything on slack that you want to keep grab it now while you can and then save it locally okay so that said the uh, bevy does not let me our bevy um, pla registration platform that most of you have used does not let us put links directly to the slide decks because uh, it only works with uh, SlideShare. And I don't want to use SlideShare. We have our own system for the slide decks. Uh, it's just as G, uh, G slide documents. And so the links to the slide decks are in the YouTube description, but you have to actually click through and use the feature on YouTube where it says, you know, if you open it in Bevy, you have to actually click through and say view on YouTube then you'll be able to see the description. The very top line of the description will be a link to the slide deck. If you want to do, you know, that's where you can get the links more easily just by clicking them rather than retyping them. So okay. that's also why I created the study yeah. doc Correct. Um, that we have exactly. pinned in the channel. So all the links are in there and updated each week. Yeah, Jessica has been updating the links as we go. And then also, um, that document will be moved to a persistent store at the end of this end of the workshops, and then otherwise it would, I think, it would disappear also with our Slack, um, with the Slack that we're using. So that's all good. Um, someone pinged me on Slack yesterday, um, uh, saying they didn't get Skills Boost access, but I didn't see that person uh in the registration list or it didn't seem that the, the person had ever joined a meeting so just to be clear just joining slack doesn't get you access to skills boost you actually have to come to a meeting you have to register and 
show up for at least one meeting. And then the skills boost access should be granted within a couple of days automatically. If that doesn't happen, then we can intervene and contact support. But normally it's been happening pretty smoothly. So just to be clear, obviously, if you're all hearing me now <laughs> speaking this in real time, you are here, you've joined a meeting, you've registered, obviously, you should have access. If this is your first event, you should have access to Skills Boost tomorrow or the following day at the latest. If not, then ping me on Slack. But I think the person who contacted me thought that just joining Slack would get you into Skills Boost, and that's not that's not how it works, of course. Um, we did, a couple weeks ago, run over time. Uh, we're gonna make every effort to stop at eight o'clock um, and probably a little bit before on most evenings. And uh, in order to help us with that, I've set, I've set an alarm clock for seven and that'll be a checkpoint and we'll just kind of like take a breath, figure out where we are, and see how much there is left and then that'll prevent us from running over, we hope. And then also one of our earlier sessions, we had sample questions that were clearly from a non-database learning path. So they were, we went through them so that you could understand how to dissect the questions and have a strategy for answering them. But they were not the database questions that we want. So we have the right questions today. Um, Jessica put them into Slido. I'm not 100% sure that the Slido is working correctly still, but we'll we'll find out when we get there. And so that's it for housekeeping. So as you know, uh, if you've been here before, the um, I looked over all the courses in the learning path and tried to approximate how much effort would be required for each course. And based on that, I put together our working plan. Okay, so as we've mentioned a few times, this course three, Enterprise Database Migration, it has both a lot of video lessons and also a lot of labs, you know, 20, 20 hours worth of labs, including a very difficult uh, Oracle labs so that a, few, a couple people did, did finish, so that's great. Um, I think the um, four and five have been probably a little bit uh, more straightforward. So hopefully that's the case and we'll have time for questions in a, in a few minutes. Um, based on the assessment that I did, we're now in week, well, we call week five. Uh, it's the third formal session. And if you count our info session as week zero, then we're actually in week five. So this is the numbering system that we're using maybe not the best one, but that's what we're going to stay with is the way it's laid out on this slide. And so our goals for today were to finish the uh, the MySQL migration course and also the Postgres course here. And then looking forward to the next couple of weeks, we'll be getting into Spanner and, and Bigtable. And so um, with that, uh, let's you know, the week five, today's content rev review. So that ideally, uh, people would be uh, finished with all of these um, labs that are in both of these two courses, or um, uh, making good progress and wrapping up to, to, towards completing these. And so uh, the, two, the two specific courses are called Migrate MySQL Data to Cloud SQL, using database migration service and then the second course is manage postgres uh, sorry manage postgres on uh, database on cloud sql i've just seen a typo there this there's a capital l on cloud sql <laughs> which i thought i thought i'd caught all those but there's a couple couple of typos here remaining um, so let's look at the um the mysql content um, so what are we doing here? We're really learning more than anything how to use this database migration service that Google provides. And uh, because MySQL is a relatively um, easier to manage database than some others, uh, particularly 
a full featured database like Oracle is definitely more complex than MySQL. So when we talk about migrating, it's really about moving the data. And as we see um, in, the, in the next slides here, and I've mentioned earlier, migration is all about planning and um, not interrupting the business that's being run on that database, right? So if you're moving a production database, you can't just turn it off for a week and then casually move the data over and then turn it back on on the other side, you know, in, in the cloud. It doesn't work that way. <laughs> and um, so if we look at this so-called big picture here, um, let's let's take a look at all, all the, the other things that we have to do to plan a successful migration. Um, so overall, we have to do now this is one approach um we've talked earlier about um migration patterns and some companies try to re-architect and move to the cloud at the same time so they'll say well we're doing this you know digital transformation it's a big effort in our company we want to get to the cloud but we also want to um uh, retire some legacy apps and refactor the code as we're moving to the cloud. I think that's actually um, a more complicated way of doing things, and it's uh, a, a higher risk approach. So I think that you know the lift and shift approach that's described here can actually be very effective. I think many people criticize lift and shift as being simplistic or uh, you know, missing the opportunity to to simultaneously refactor and rearchitect the code while you're moving it. Um, I have been on projects where there were deadlines to get out of an on-premise data center, so it was a co-location facility. The lease was expiring. There was a hard deadline for getting out of that data center, and the approach that we used was get to the cloud in the shortest possible time, get moved to Google Cloud as quickly as possible. And that involved most, it was almost lift and shift in terms of the functionality of the code, but it was, it was replatforming at the same time. It was going from one database system, I won't mention the name, it was going from one database system to BigQuery and as the target. And so, but the code was being ported and translated. It was not, be, so it's being replatformed, but it wasn't being at the same time re-architected and the whole thing, you know, refactored and all that stuff. So it was literally just taking all the business logic, taking all the pipelines that were existing on premises, moving them to Google Cloud. It was almost a lift and shift. And the point of it being that we successfully got out of the data center on time and shut that thing down. And it was um, a big win all around. And then there's time enough when you're in the cloud to refactor and re-architect. So I think the criticism for lift and shift is that sometimes it's sold as something, as a quick way to get to the cloud. And then you think, oh, well, once we get shifted, you know, after the lift shift is done and we're shifted, then we're finished. Well, no, that's not right. That's just really um the the first few steps on the journey to really effectively you know use the cloud in a very effective way so that's what we say about that so again the strategy that google uh, this is a strategy i don't think it's the only one but the one that google advocates here is as i said migrate um using lift and shift approach so minimal changes on the way while you're migrating take the business logic, take everything over, possibly replatform. Um, modernize would include moving off of what Google calls old guard vendors to enterprise class, open, open source software compatible databases. So an example of this would be one that we mentioned already previously would be migrating from Oracle to Postgres and Postgres being an open source database that can be run under 
as a managed service under Cloud SQL, and it's very full featured, so it has many of the features that Oracle has, and so it's possible to do, you know, contemplate that migration. Uh, it's going to involve rewriting code and refactoring code and other things like that, but that's that's what um, many many Google customers are doing. That and then transform over here on the right is what I was talking about is really um, re-architecting, refactoring, um, using cloud native databases and, cl and platform integration. So this would mean maybe uh, breaking up a, mon a large monolithic database and a, a large application that went with a large monolithic database, refactoring that into a microservice oriented approach so that um, typically when you go to microservices it's common for each microservice to have its own data store or database so that might involve splitting up a large monolithic database into smaller and more manageable pieces um, it's not always the best thing so it does require um, careful planning again uh, some companies have found that uh, microservices actually um, introduce complexity and artificially divide teams that used to work together are now working separately. So it depends really on your organizational structure of your development teams as well as to how you do the transformation piece on the right. Okay, so in general, when we move to GCP managed databases, right, we want to get out of the business of running everything manually, okay, installing every, you know, running every database server, worrying about all the licensing, worrying about patching of servers and database software, keeping up with security patches and all that. That's that's the approach on the left is we try to get away from that if we can and move to um, managed service like uh, Postgres under Cloud SQL, MySQL under Cloud SQL, or Microsoft SQL Server as a Cloud SQL managed service. And so this just frees up your team from having to do a lot of a lot of extra toil, as we call it. And it would be um, I would I would not say that you can completely eliminate the job role of database administrator. Um, usually you still need a DBA somewhere. You need a DBA role somewhere. And as we talked about last week, that role can be one person within a team or it can be uh, a function that's allocated across several different people in a team or shared in that way. But usually, uh, sometimes some vendors and consultants suggest that you can just get rid of, you know, entirely get rid of DBAs, and that's not quite true. You still, somebody needs to worry, for example, about security, and there are some database design considerations that are um, often handled by people with specialized skills. Whether you call that person a DBA or not, or you know, architect, whatever, you still need somebody with fairly good database knowledge. Um, now, when you, the other thing you might be doing when you move to the cloud, it's actually becoming more common to use. Um, this is the the point made on the right side of this slide. It's more common to use uh, multi-cloud architectures than uh, than it was and it's um, the reasons for using multi-cloud architecture are getting to be um, more compelling I would say um, a few years ago it was said that virtually every large enterprise was using uh, was using multiple cloud providers and I I talked to a lot of people in in the companies who are you know on LinkedIn. I would find p 
people that had job titles of solution architect or or a cloud architect or whatever. And I, I would just ask them like, how, how many clouds are you using in your company? And I would usually get back an answer that was of the nature, um, mostly one, mostly one, and then a little bit of some other one, right? And so what I was reading in the trade press and in popular, you know, so-called um, um, reviews on LinkedIn and other places like that, it was like multi-cloud is like pervasive, everybody's doing it. And, you know, the the unscientific survey that I made on my own just didn't match that, what was being reported in the trade press is that like everybody's doing it. So, so I actually, um, five years ago decided that, well, about four years ago, <clears throat> realized that for small companies, small enterprises, um, you should probably focus on using one cloud well, rather than having a multi-cloud strategy. It's just not the case that the cloud service providers are just like fungible resources that you can just shift from one to the other without effort. That's just not true. And so uh, you do need expertise on each cloud that you have in your cloud estate. And so uh, for small companies, I think multiple clouds is not the best idea. For large companies, it's a fact of life. It, it either happens by accident or by acquisition or because uh, individual teams are allowed to choose whichever cloud provider they want, m lots of different reasons. But as, as I mentioned a, a few weeks back, um, there are now some really good partnerships developing between Google and Oracle, for example, and Oracle and Microsoft, Microsoft Azure as another good example. And so there actually are emerging some really uh, strong business cases for using multiple clouds. And even though the architecture is more complex and you do need more specialized skill sets in your team, it can be worth it to use a multi-cloud approach. Uh, and, and I mentioned a few of those um, um, as we go along. Now, again, Jessica, I'm, I'm not watching the chat. So if anything, uh, <laughs> I'm seeing a couple comments here. I'm not going to watch them, though. I want to keep going. And then uh, if anything urgent comes up, let me know. Um, no, of so, course, it's yeah. it's it's Kasaba adding value. <laughs> yeah, I to see, the... <laughs> I see adding, adding some commentary, which is great. <laughs> Thank you for that. <laughs> so let's get back to the idea of migration. So um, as it says, the whole the migration process overall is complex because of you know it's like the old uh, expression in IT is like wow, it would be so easy to run this system except for the users. You know, if we didn't have to worry about the users, we'd be, we'd, it'd be so much easier. And the problem is, you know, when you're running a, uh, you're running a large active database in production, you can't simply um, shut it off and then migrate and then turn it back on. It, you've got to have a continuous, some kind of a, some kind of a way to get um, continuous operation and then migrate over or cut over in a in a very plan in a very carefully planned way. Okay, and so that's what this point on the left is that it's complex. And if you so first of all, you've got to unravel the dependencies. You figure out how it is you're going to move a database. Um, the suggestion is if you're moving completely from on-premises to the cloud, you know, you would select a database that is maybe not, not trivially simple, but don't take the biggest, most complex one. And the complex means has the most connections to application code as well. So if you have, you know, some databases are very much in the center of multiple applications, that's probably not the one you should pick to do, you know, do your first migration. So that that's just um, all part of the strategy involved. So the um, the time consuming what in the middle here, the time consuming high toil parts of this are 
Um, the moving to data is actually probably the simplest part of it. Um, if you are doing cross-engine conversion, like the project I described a moment ago, you'll have some code rewriting to do. All the databases we're talking about use SQL, but they have different dialects, and the database tables have different, um, slightly different data types usually, and uh, the SQL code will have different dialects. So there is some conversion effort in going cross-engine, so to speak, from, or what I call replatforming. And then on the far right, it's what I've already mentioned. If you're, you know, mission critical databases, migrating large scale, those are risky projects and you have to plan that strategy carefully. So the database migration service from Google offers some really helpful um, technology here where, first of all, you know, I can imagine for a simple database, you could, let's, let's, say, let's take an easy case where you had a, a simple database that, or maybe a, a set of databases on one server, but they were not like super large um, and they also were not, and, and they could also tolerate some downtime. So let's say they were only used during the business week they weren't used during the weekend. So Friday night, you could shut things off, back up, do a you know backup with um, so-called dump command, um, and then move that backup file to the cloud, and then restore it on the new on the target system. And especially if you're going using the same engine on both sides. That's fairly that you know that's the easy that's as easy as it gets, right? Just do a backup and a restore. You can have the downtime. You can uh, you keep both databases running until you're completely satisfied that the restore has gone well, and you could run some QA on the data. And then if that's all successful, you could just repoint the applications to the new database server and you would be that that would be it so but that's the easiest possible case we usually don't have things that are that easy um, so the database migration service helps in the sense that we can use it for um, it's 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 less man it's less manual work right it's not doing um, well first of all when you do backup and restore strategy that assumes that you're using the same engine or the same platform on both both before and after. That may not be true. So you may want to go from Oracle to Cloud SQL. So you want the data mic this DMS service offers you that possibility that the data type conversions will be automated for you. And so that handles a lot of the um, details of of, of managing the data types. Um, and the other thing is that the timing, the timing is critical here as well. So the DMS will work in two modes. It will do kind of a bulk transfer to bring most of the data over. And that's relatively straightforward, but then you still have that remaining, let's say the last few hours of transactions that have come in, you can't lose those either. You have to move those over. And so then you um, can usually do uh, like, tr let's say transfer all the historical data that you have in your database, transfer it up to a point in time like Sunday night, right? That would be one big load. You could get that done, QA it, make sure it's working well. And then you could do the remaining last few days worth of transactions. You could do that in um with a streaming interface and that streaming interface in dms can keep up with uh, the incoming transactions then at some point you choose a window when your database is like at its most quiet point during the day and you say okay we're going to actually stop transactions from coming in to the old database right we're going to turn that off and um 
allow the replication to catch up so that everything is moved over and then and then at that point we should be able to switch over to the new database okay so that's the theory of it and the labs have um had you go through there were three labs to execute these steps using mysql and we learned uh as i mentioned the two scenarios with dms is a, a one-time dms job which of course would would bring you current up to some point in time but if you are constantly receiving new transactions then the one time one time dms job is not going to be sufficient uh, you know you can't just do once and then cut over if you have an active active production database that's needed 24/7 you'll have to do some combination of maybe the move the bulk of the data in the in a one time job qa it test it and then set up the continuous job to catch catch up the remaining um recent history so you have like a deeper history and then recent history and that so this can be the most effective way to get these um migrations done i won't go uh, through there, you go ahead there is a there is a question yeah. um i don't think you've answered it uh that Vanu asks about performance overhead running a database inside a container uh okay mm. uh yeah so because like it it could affect uh i guess if you're trying to network inside and outside the container you, you could have some slowdown there with your reads and writes so that that's kind of part of the question yes is i, I uh, mean I personally have not had experience with running databases inside containers. Um, I know that it can be done. Um, you know, I, the database I work with most is BigQuery, actually, so that's kind of its own. Um, Which is technically not a database. <laughs> right. According yeah. to our learning path here, it's not a database. It's an analytic uh, data warehouse, right? Which right. is Google calls as a separate from these databases. So, and and BigQuery is actually serverless. So, um, yeah. And Glenn Glenn has a good point that it's good for dev testing, but, but okay. not realistic for prod. And, and yeah, I was trying to think of like if I've yeah. seen a production situation of running a container, a production container, a production database in a container, and I have not I've not seen that. It's good for like and they have examples of spinning up things with like terraform scripts and stuff inside a container so for testing that's really good if you're using like the same terraform scripts yeah of course um and it's it's quick it's like quick and easy and consistent but um i can't say like a, the exact like resource loss you would have in terms of like the networking but the kind of common like sense sort of assumption is that like you're going to have issues passing if you're passing lots of data like across network and um it gets definitely gets complicated um, yeah i so, yeah I've not, I've not seen a production execution of that for sure i i actually now that i think of it i've seen one uh, one project in production where they used um, they had a fairly large Cassandra database, which is um, one type of NoSQL database that we haven't really talked about yet, but we'll get to that in a couple of weeks. Um, th they were running that inside a Kubernetes cluster, and I don't know if that was a if they were having performance problems or not. Um, we were looking at that project in terms of um cost uh cost metrics but i i think this performance was satisfactory i don't know if it would have been better you know by running on vms so i i guess we're saying that it so what would be the motivation for running yeah what would be the motivation for running inside uh, Kubernetes or GKE would be to get uh, more efficient utilization of resources, right? That's the point of containerization lets you uh, 
create a GKE cluster and run um, containerized applications in that cluster. And hopefully overall, that would be more efficient than running VMs for each application because VMs carry a lot of overhead in terms of having a full copy of the operating system code as opposed to the lightweight, much lighter weight um, container container environment. So that would be the advantage possibly doing it. I, I think what we're coming up with is that in most situations, um, a, a heavily used production database probably would would either, you'd either run it as Cloud SQL Managed Service or you would run it probably on your own VMs if you needed that greater level of control. Uh, okay, uh, let me let me come back to that point because uh, well, I'll, I'll address it now. Most most relational database systems like RD. RDBMS that we're talking about um, don't actually scale out, scale horizontally. They don't scale horizontally very easily anyway. <laughs> okay, because the uh, yeah exactly as Glenn's pointing out here in the chat, the the writes most relational DBMS are written in such a way that the writes are all going to one set of disks. So usually it's easier to add uh, read replicas, but you wouldn't want, if you are adding those read replicas, you wouldn't want them in the same availability zone anyway. So you'd probably want them in a different zone and that's going to make it, I think, harder to run it inside a cluster, in a, in a Kubernetes cluster. So um, the big exception of this is Spanner, uh, which does, scale out horizontally. That's a very unusual product. We're going to talk about that next week, of course, as we move into the Spanner Labs. But that's designed in a completely different way. And it's and it's uh, designed for that purpose. And it's run as a managed service by Google. So again, not something you would be running inside your own GKE cluster. Um, I think that's probably covered this. We can maybe come back to this if we need to yeah okay uh we can have we'll have a q a at the end but I, I i one of the things that got us off time <laughs> a couple weeks ago was we spent a lot of time uh going into uh details and uh, went down some rabbit holes so i want to save the if there's further discussion let's save it for the q a um i i wasn't planning to go through each of these labs in detail um you've either I mean, most people will have completed some of these labs or maybe all of them. And so I don't see any point in like reviewing each lab because the video lessons have uh, a number of lab reviews and um, some, some do, some don't, right? But, but, there, but there are some reviews there in the, in the, in the, among the video lessons that were provided by Google. So I wasn't planning to dive into all these labs unless there are, are specific questions, but let's just look at the remaining two that are in the MySQL course. And the the um, the point I want to make here, when we migrate and we do this promotion step, which they've called out on this next slide, they make a big Google makes a big point of when you're getting ready to promote promote the migration job means you have done the migration you've done some amount you've done at least some qa on the target database system to um make sure that everything's moved over successfully the amount of qa that you do really depends on the uh the risk that you're willing to tolerate if you're working with very important financial data, like if it's the, if the data is concerning the um, you know the revenue of the company and you're going to generate the quarterly financial reports off of that, you probably want to be super careful about how you QA that data migration. 
you, uh, but just for example, some of the things you might try would be just count, you know, just to simple row counts. If the, if you think that you've completely repl replicated a database, then the row counts for every table should match. So that's pretty basic. That doesn't prove that the data is identical. Uh, it just proves that something moved over for every row. So it's still possible to have errors and additional checks that you can do are, um, what we call data profiling, right? So you could do on the you could do the following on both the source system and the target system. You could for every t for every column and every table, you could do something like find me the find the min, the max, and the average. Uh, you typically would not want to be summing uh, summing things up because if you have a fairly large database and you sum up. Um, values, you're probably going to overflow that data type, right? And it's quite possible that the sum of everything you've recorded is greater than that data type can handle and at an individual row level, right? So that summing is not great. Another thing you can look at is uh, correlation. This works for numeric data, obviously not, not so for uh, string data or VARCAR data. But for uh, for numeric data, it's common to do uh, a correlation between two columns and uh, look at things that way and make sure that you know. So it it, it go it ranges from going from like a basic sanity check, which would be like the row counts, up to an, a very elaborate QA plan that would show that uh, every row is is actually correct and every column is actually correct of the critical data that you care about. Now, another thing to watch out for is if you're doing a cross-engine migration, then like a platform going from one platform to another and you have uh, floating data types or non-integers um, non or non-exact um, non numeric data types, Right, which would be float anything like a, f a floating uh, or um, uh, sometimes called a real a real uh, value. It's good to remember that those may differ very very slightly in the you know umpteenth decimal point out, and that can be actually influenced by the CPU chip that the servers are running on so the you know a float a f I, I don't know i can't think of an example where that actually makes a difference but a float on one database may not be precisely exactly the same to every last digit as a float on another date on another database and that's simply because of rounding errors that might be beyond the control even of the database software itself, right? It may be uh, depending on the hardware that, that's being used. And so that can be, so if you think you can just like compare the min and the max or something like that and say, okay, it has to be exactly a perfect match, you may get into trouble there. So you have to usually allow a tolerance. And in some scenarios where I've worked, even with financial data, there was, um, a tolerant like the project one of the projects I mentioned earlier that I worked on we usually allowed a tolerance of something like you know 0.1 percent so like if the, if the if the source and target were within you know 99.9 percent um, that you know the variation could be one part in a thousand in other words and that would be acceptable because it was assumed that there was a slight timing issue or the data hadn't, you know, hadn't caught up completely. And it, the point is, if the data is very valuable and very sensitive, it can take a lot of effort to QA it really well. Okay, so let me get back to this, this question that's on the screen here is promote the migration job. I just want to point out, last week we talked about um, deployment, uh, deployment options, right, of how you you could either migrate to a new 
system, right? It could be, this could be a web server or a database server. It could be anything, right? Anything in the cloud. You can migrate using a Canary deployment where you slowly feed traffic, divert traffic from the old system to the new system and then test it out in that way. Or you could do a, a rapid cutover and we call that the blue green approach. And I mentioned some of the SRE books where these um, ideas came from. So this, where you're promoting the migration job, that is a classic example of blue green deployment strategy, right? So you're, you've done the migration, you think it's good, you've done some QA, you're ready to cut over. When you do this promotion, you will then be replacing the source with the target. In other words, you're switching from the old to the new database and that then so when you when you do this in the cloud um google repoints the application to the new database server in that way so that's the advantage of using these um some of the tools that are uh made available to you by google cloud okay let's i think we're going to now to the postgres part of this and um there were several labs here for um postgres as well in this in this course um, so postgres is a managed service within cloud sql and how does that work um i i updated this slide actually the most recent data is that you can run postgres up to version 16 which is the current latest version of postgres and uh, with 15 being still the default right now. And you can go back all the way to 9.6. And that uh, 9.6 is in, will soon, uh, some, some of these lower number versions will soon enter what's called the, the EOL phase, the end of life phase. And so they will go into a period of a few years where they get extended support but they don't get a lot of they don't get feature upgrades anymore right so they get security patches and bug fixes but they don't get new features and i i forget exactly which versions but 9.6 and a couple of the others will will be entering this uh what's called extended support period and that lasts i think for another three years and then those older versions actually become deprecated meaning that it'll become harder and harder to get any support for them at all so it's a pretty long lifespan for each version um, it gives you plenty of time to have a migration plan in place for doing a version upgrade that's a fairly straightforward process if you're uh, especially in the cloud, if you're already in the cloud, it's fairly easy to spin up another instance of Cloud SQL with the newer version, and then you could do a you know a backup and restore type of strategy to build out a test database that's running on the new version. You could then do your QA on that. Um, for the most part, upgrading to a newer version in theory should work pretty seamlessly because the um, postgres and other vendors try not to break the backwards compatibility right so usually everything that works in 15 should also work in 16 unless it's been called out as something that's that's actually being deprecated and so um, usually a lot of applications can be migrated upwards to a new version and then retested, but there's not typically a lot of um, code rework that comes along with um, with going up to the next version. Now, there, I'm sure there are exceptions, but um, it's usually not that big a deal. The other thing that um, Cloud SQL offers you is um, there are a lot of support for what are called Postgres, Postgres extensions. We used actually one of those extensions in one of the labs. Um, it was the um, P3 
PG logical extension, if I remember the name, and that was actually used to uh, assist with migration with some of the migration steps. And so that's an example of the um, Postgres extensions that are available to you. Um, I wanted to, I didn't quite get a chance to look at this cloud SQL insights feature. Uh, did anyone, anyone have knowledge of that cloud SQL insights? It looks like something interesting. Um, I know observability is a big issue in the last couple of years with more focus on uh, cost of running every service in the cloud and with the uh, improvement in just Google Cloud and all the all the other cloud vendors are increasing their efforts in the observability area to make uh, cost reporting more open and more uh, easier easier to understand, I should say, right? Then that's part of the uh, FinOps area. I uh, won't say too much more about that, but progress is being made on, on many fronts by many vendors in that area. Um, the other thing that Cloud SQL gives you is really good integration with um, BigQuery and Cloud Run. It's mentioned here, GKE, uh, integration with key service. I don't think that means that you can run Postgres on GKE, though. It means that you can communicate with applications that are running within GKE. So it's not quite the same question that we had a few minutes ago. And then finally, we have the uh, the DMS that we used a lot in the MySQL course. We have that available with Postgres also for um, more of a managed approach to doing these migrations rather than doing everything by hand and manually. And also uh, the security is improved when you use the DMS as well. So with that, um, again, next couple of slides here just really call out the individual labs that people have gone through in the last week or so. I don't think I will step through these slides in detail unless there are questions about an individual lab. So there, there was that first one. Now I know that I know this first one. If I back up to this first one. Uh, there were some questions in Slack about this that um, were there for a few days, and I answered one of the questions today concerning um, the need for making a separate user that had a tailored privileges to do this migration. And that, would, that was an example of uh, the principle of, you know, the security principle of least privilege, right, is that you would want to create users that have um, the adequate privileges needed to do a certain task, but not not massively overprivileged. And in any case, we definitely don't want to just do everything as, you know, the, the Postgres, um, all-powerful Postgres user, uh, all-powerful within the database. And if anybody wants to see, I did a pretty long write-up on Slack about that, and we'll I think we'll capture that and put it in our our um, document at the end of the uh, at the end of the workshops here. So, um, I believe me, I think we've all been on projects where the entire project was done with every developer had full admin rights on the database, and um, it really becomes a serious problem toward maybe two thirds of the way through the project, somebody realizes that it's impossible to deploy anything to production in that fashion. And uh, I was um, put into the task of actually securing a system that had been, the whole thing had been built with every developer having full admin rights. And I had to come up with a security policies for following at least somewhat close to the principle of least privilege, right? And not just massively overprivilege everything. Um, and then what happens is as you work through those, this was an on-premises world, so we didn't have a spare system, so to speak, as you might be able to do in the cloud. 
you could probably spin up a small system now and experiment with the privileges. But basically, I had to do this on the production the system that was about to go into production. I had to work out a set of privileges. And then working through that process, I ended up disabling some features that developers needed. And then, you know, literally have a whole development team screaming at me that they can't work because I'm taking away their privileges. So I don't recommend, I just recommend don't even start there. Don't even, don't even start the project with giving everybody admin privileges. Take the time to set up the proper roles from the beginning so that developers have some reasonable set of privileges. It doesn't, at the beginning, it could be somewhat overprivileged, like you could just say, on this database, I'm giving these group of developers pretty broad privileges to own data, update data, create tables, things like create views, things like that. So you could make it somewhat overprivileged, but definitely don't give everyone admin. It's just going to be a nightmare when you get toward the end of the project, uh, the, to the deployment of that project. So um, several more labs here in, um, in, in Skills Boost that are part of this. Um, Quest, uh, sometimes Quick Labs use the word Quest to mean um, those group of courses that are that are in a part of the learning path. I'm, I'm just calling these labs within a course, actually. That's how Skills Boost has presented it to us in this learning path, right? But sometimes it's called a Quest as well. You'll see that word. And then I think we wrap up with a couple of more here at the end. Now, the last one, as you found out, the last lab in each course here is a challenge lab where the requirements are given at a high level that the step-by-step -step detail steps are not provided. So you, you, most of the earlier labs that are pre, prior to the challenge lab, they give you the individual steps and you can either, you know, either type them in and execute them or copy paste them whatever works for you but it's in in the challenge lab you have to actually probably typically they refer back to things that have been done in an earlier lab so you may have to review the earlier lab you may not you don't have to run the lab per se the earlier lab but you can go back you can go back I'm getting my uh, seven o'clock checkpoint here so let me let me wrap this up here then you can go back to uh, read the text of the earlier lab and see what the steps were. And if, if need be, you can refer to Google documentation as well. And you should be able to get through most of the challenge labs in that way. So um, let me see where we are here. I think that's the end of this. Yeah, we're coming now to sample questions review. So we just had our seven o'clock checkpoint. I think we're in good shape to uh, finish by eight o'clock today. So um, we're, I don't think we're in danger of running over today. Now, I we could either do the Q&A now or we could do a few sample questions first. Um, we had five. There was one question that I missed yeah. in the chat. I don't think you got to it. Okay. That was from earlier, so like 15 minutes ago. Okay. Um, well, that? <laughs> it says asking, how does practicing with DMS in these scenarios help in real world applications? Like, are they depicting a real world migration scenario, like uh, covering the architecture diagrams, et cetera? Well, so I. If Thanush is still on, they might need to come on and explain, uh, give a little more background into their question. If you need it, yeah. Well, let me take a shot at what I think it. What I think it is is that the DMS handles the scenario when you're going from from like schema to like schema. In other words, you're not refactoring the tables. You're keeping the same table structure, and it it's going to bring the data over. I think it does allow a uh, replatforming, right? So it'll it'll handle the case where Let's say you're going from Oracle to Postgres. It will handle the data type conversions for you. 
but I don't think it's going to be very effective in um, refactoring the table structures on the fly. Um, now, that raises the question, if you do want to refactor the, the table structures, where do you want to do that? I mean, do you want to do that on the old system beforehand, or do you want to do it on the new system after you migrate? I think in most cases, you're probably going to want to migrate first, especially if you're under deadline pressure to close down your data center or that sort of thing. Migrate first, get on to the new, especially if you're changing platforms, you know, if you're, if you're um, moving to a, um, what's the word Google uses, a cross, um, cross-platform migration, if you're doing that, then I would say migrate first and then refactor, because otherwise you're going to write new code on the old system, and then you're going to have to port that code over to the, get it to work on the new system. So that seems like a lot more work to me. So I don't know if there's anyone else. Um, Glenn, maybe you have some more comments on that, or anyone else, actually. I put you on the spot. <laughs> there you are. <laughs> Hi. I I don't really have much uh, comments on that. Um, I I was gonna say though, like, so I I already I already wrote my exam. I already I had to I realized I had to do that like two weeks ago because it was gonna expire. Oh, uh, you wrote you wrote this exam? I already wrote it already. Yeah. Oh, okay, good for you. <laughs> but um, as you know. Um, as a exam tip, I would mm -hmm. say like a lot of the, so a lot, so you talked about migration, uh, migrations early on, right? Um, yeah. and if you look at the question, a lot of the questions, if there's any like migration related questions, uh, a lot of them are scenario based. So they'll tell you different scenarios. So there, there'll be a lot of right answers, but you need to understand mm -hmm. the scenario to choose the most appropriate one. Yeah. Right. Some of them they might reference, you know, uh the uptime that's required. Yeah. Right. Uh some might uh reference, you know, is this a is this a dev environment? Is this a prod environment? Um some might say, you know, where they're migrating from. Right? Right. Uh, so so as an example, like uh um Say if they're they're migrating from on prem, and this is like the, their first migration to the cloud. With with you know what you were presenting before about you know lift and shift, you got the 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 you know re, you know re redesign everything and all that right. You would go for the you would go for the simplest answer. In that yeah. case, right? Yeah. It, again, again yeah. a lot of it really depends on the scenario, but when you read. My my advice is to uh, for migration related questions. There will be a lot of right answers, but there's only one right answer for the scenario. Yeah, so I'm glad you, I'm glad you're making this point because yeah. the way I've been talking through this evening is uh, looking at the tools that Google provides and giving you kind of my general advice on how to approach migrations. You're now pivoting to what is a likely question to be on the exam and and we're getting in now into the exam strategy which is great great uh, segue because we're about to go into sample question review right so um it, it's slightly different right it's it, it the exam is more of a uh like, like glenn said it's an it's a scenario based uh situation where there there is probably one answer that is better than the others multiple answers could be correct but there's one that's going to stand out as being better and uh, glenn is just kind of explaining how you might reason through that and we'll step through some of that in the in the sample questions that we look at but the the thing that i'm have been going through this evening is like in the real world things are actually usually more complicated than in our lab environments and in our even in the exam right because 
that's the ultimate scenario is <laughs> like doing doing stuff in production with you know with a business waiting with a heavy heavy production use um and with deadlines you know that becomes then a situation where you need to plan very carefully so a little bit different emphasis uh you know i've been trying to give some real world um uh perspective on this and and i think uh quite correctly glenn put in some of the some of the exam strategy as well is important Let's see how we did here. Oh. Uh, but that's the wrong answer. I think that is the wrong answer. That's the answer that's given. I questioned this, but that's the answer that was given in uh, the no, deck. That, that is definitely the wrong answer. Oh, that's the answer that's given mm -hmm. in the slides? Yeah. Oh, it wow. Be, unless I messed it up. Uh, oh, oh, let's I see. Let's see. Let me double check. Let me double check. Yeah, could you double check that? Because uh, I think Glenn and I are going to the same place, which is. Uh, this and I is give a, that is that is the answer that is given by oh Google Slides. Gosh. Yes, oh I just I just oh, yeah, that. Yeah, nope, yeah, that yeah. Is wrong. I'm I'm going. Yep. I gave yep. this last week as a as an example. Remember, I said there is a. I call that the spanner tip off phrases. Whenever you uh -huh. see the word, whenever you see the word globe, you should immediately be thinking spanner. Spanner. <laughs> yeah. Right. Because yeah. um yeah, spanner is yeah. spanner is unique among among all databases that I'm aware of. I mean it's unique among Google, but also other cloud providers don't have anything like spanner. So it's um uh the one that it's the one relational database management system that scales horizontally and it still manages to do acid compliance in globally distributed and it does that through very special uh time synchronization technology and uh i don't know the exact details of it but uh it and we'll get to it in the next week but so, yeah and, glenn, are you, and it's glenn, crazy because even even glenn because i'm looking I went in this and even um, the explanation in the notes in the original slide deck <laughs> explains like why it thinks that top answer is oh, the okay. answer. Oh, okay. Okay. Glenn, you're thinking this is a spanner, right? Yeah, it is. It is spanner. So yeah. Yeah. I, I was going to go. But I'm saying Glenn, like even the explanation in the Google Docs is saying yeah. it's not it's not spanner for these reasons. And I'm but, like, I don't but, uh, I still don't think it's right. <laughs> <laughs> look at look at other other keywords such as simple applications. So these are uh, it, simple applications means that it's probably not a banking application or not a probably some simple CRUD, right? And simple uh, apps, okay. So, so okay. S simple or not, like uh, the fact that it is SQL, it is it's going to be crud. So all these are crud. So okay, so easily we can rule, rule out the last one because yeah. uh, it's not going to be multi master. Yes, you know, only one master. Right. So that's absolutely wrong. Um, the the current correct answer is a viable answer if Spanner wasn't in there. So there's a couple of things, right? It's it's depends on. Uh, it's saying so the explanation they're giving the explanation they're giving Glenn is that Cloud Spanner does not provide support for store procedures. Oh yes, yeah, yes, 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 yes. The other keyword is that it's the so the Spanner PostgreSQL interface is just a dialect, and so when you yeah. talk about features, 
the feature is not necessarily just dialect. So yeah, so that's I, why. I so, so Saba, you actually think the top answer is the correct uh, answer? No, actually, I went with alloy because I said that <laughs> I said that alloy is a little better than just simple cloud SQL. And I was yeah. like, mm. okay, let's give a little more oomph than just the simple cloud SQL, and let's go with alloy. Interesting. Yeah, but well, alloy is a I newer think one. According to Google, we're all wrong. <laughs> that is Glenn, you, Glenn, you know the test. Like you know the people who make the tests. Like maybe you need to ask somebody. Yeah, no, I, yeah. I'll, you know what? I, I will. I will this were on the I'll, test. I'll, 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 I'll take this away. But uh, I, 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 I think this has been is, uh, Spanner. Yeah, I went for Spanner also. Yeah. Yeah, but but, but I think on global. You might. Sorry, folks, we're learning. But uh, yeah, I think if this were actually. If this is a question on the test, according to Google, we would be wrong. Okay. I'll, I'll, don't worry, I'll, so, I'll this way. I'm, okay, I'm okay. Follow up in Slack. Yeah. Well, we've we've learned. We I think we've all learned something. I hope. Hopefully, we're learning the um, the approach to look at the questions. And in this case, we actually disagree on what the answer is. So, so it, it's quite interesting, but. Um, we will be undaunted and move to the next question and see how we do <laughs> on these later ones. And we, I promise we will get the uh, definitive answers hammered out in the next week or so, and we'll, we'll, we'll revisit these. Okay, so this isn't the final word on this. So let's see what... Uh, let's see if Google two. does better the next time <laughs> <laughs> for the next question. <laughs> okay, so I'm gonna start. Uh, I'll give two minutes again, and then I'll give a warning. Okie dokie. The answer here, okay. Uh, let me so see. I agree with this one. I yeah, agree with Google correct. on this one. This yeah, is correct. So oh, so the, the one in green, the one in green is the correct answer always? Yeah. You According to Google, and I agree yeah. with that. Yeah, you yeah. cannot lift and shift Oracle. This one to me was a little more straightforward. The, the whole premise of, um, Oracle on bare metal is because uh, Oracle has a uh, the, the pricing model is their their licensing model is based off CPUs, so it doesn't really yeah. work well. They didn't well recently they had an agreement, but prior to this yeah. they didn't have an agreement with Google yeah. in terms of uh, how how licensing works. So you can't run that on Compute Engine. You cannot. Mm -hmm. They also they won't Oracle won't support Oracle software on on anything other than Oracle hardware. Yeah, yeah. That, so so number three, let's see, one of the questions was um, compute engine, right? Which, oh, lift and shift Oracle on compute engine. That one's clearly wrong because- There's no lift and shift. That's, well, there is no Oracle There is no Oracle on compute engine, right? There, that's why we have Oracle bare metal solution. Is DMS, because, yeah, DMS yeah. is a viable solution, except like the yeah. question says they need to move fast. So yeah. that's that's the that's the um, that's the uh, keyword there, because to yeah. to migrate from Oracle to Postgres takes it's not oh, just wow. like you know Postgres yeah. to Postgres, right? It's not uh, click it's, a button. It's, yeah, it's a lot of work. Yeah, there's migration right? so, tools. There are some migration tools that will give you help. Probably some of the new Gen AI tools would give you some help, but it's it, right. It's not going to be the fastest approach. This question. So this question is a better formulated example of like when mm -hmm. there are more than one, like usually like two, like pretty good answers, but there's a keyword that distinguishes one from the other. And in this case, the idea of they need to move fast 
mm-hmm. is what like makes that difference. Like Glenn was yeah. saying, like DMS would work, migrating to Oracle, that's a great idea, but that's like, yeah. if you have a hell of a lot of time, right? Yeah, so exactly. um, this is like a much better example of like a lot I of agree. the questions, I feel I like, yeah. <laughs> and you know, the last, the last answer here, it, it, to me, it, it, it has a funny smell, if you know what I mean. In other words, you, if you're going to, from on-premises to the cloud, and your company now has a cloud-first modernization policy, the last thing you would do is go to a colo facility, right? That's so, just, that's so, either a lateral or going backwards. Yeah. So, so funny thing, funny thing is that this one I had to read twice uh-huh. because I, for a split second, I kind of considered this as a potential answer because, you know, the way, the way that, uh, Oracle on, on bare metal where yeah. is that yeah. it, it's basically is a colo that's next to a actual Google data center. Like when you yeah, run kind of, EMS, kind, uh, yeah, when you run uh, bare, uh, Oracle on bare metal, you're not running inside a Google data center. You it is actually, it is actually technically a colo, but yeah. they, they but don't like, call uh, it, they don't call like, it that. So when I saw that word colo, I said, that's definitely not the right answer. <laughs> I can't. Be. I, I saw that, and that the wording there kind of threw me off a little. For a little yeah, bit, right? that that's that's what got me. Uh, okay. That's why I, had, I hesitated for a little bit. I'm like, uh, no. Okay. No. So uh, okay, I think we did pretty well with that one. Let's go to the next one. We have five of them. We don't have to do all five. So let's just see how we how we go here. Let's do one more at least. Um, I'll start the two minute timer here. Oh, in the second answer, it should be PLSQL. It's it's P. It should, it's missing an L there. It's just PLSQ. Oh yeah, yeah. Sorry. PLSQL. So so remote factories means they are off grid. I'm just thinking out loud. Sorry. Uh, that's a good question. I don't think off grid completely, but maybe only intermittently connected to the internet or with a slow network connection or something like that, maybe. Because it says like an old, so so it sounds like an application, one application, but like yeah. there are many facility, many factories yeah. with, with mm-hmm. many installations or? Uh... I don't know. So that's two and a half minutes. I'll give a few more seconds for this one. 15 more seconds. Okay, I'm gonna call time. Last, any last guesses? Okay, this one's challenging. Let's see how we did here. Ah, okay. Uh, I would have gone with the first answer myself as well. Is there an explanation for this one, Jessica? So oddly, again, obviously that top one and the bottom one are kind of, in my opinion, the ones that are like the possible answers in this case. Yeah. And they only, the, the, the response they give only references that, um, uh they don't reference the uh the top one at all as a possible they reference the correct one being d because it would give the customer an opportunity to go to the cloud first and then refactor um Mm -hmm. that's the main answer um yeah so uh for me so oracle application does not equal oracle database um yeah, yeah, I think so, so. That's one thing. Yeah. The so for me also the the Anthos one and and the one and well the I, I selected the correct one, but 
Those yeah. two were also very close in running. But the key word here that that uh, um, put it heavy into uh, this answer is uh, is the line where it says, which makes app maintenance a burden. So, mm -hmm. so main, if maintenance is a burden, you want something managed. So you don't have to worry about maintenance. So that's right. what put the scales for me. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. But yes, yeah, so so PLSQL, uh, you know, it, so it's going to go to go to Postgres. So it's going to be the three Postgres answers, right? Uh, and 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 again, like you know, like migrating to on-prem first, and then and then migrating elsewhere. That doesn't make sense to me. So you want to go? You're going to go straight to Postgres. Um, and uh, yeah, going to going to going to GCP first makes more sense to me because you don't they don't have to worry about maintenance. Mm -hmm. I, That's I, kind of what I had been thinking as well. Yeah. I think it was important to decide that is this really how, how remote is this you know how, this end of the world uh, mm -hmm. somewhere because it sounds like you know from the wording like why do they emphasize that that much and that's why I went for for the anthos otherwise I would have picked the the right one. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think my, yeah, so I think it depends, like the way I read the question, right, in terms of, there, I didn't read it so much of like remote factories, meaning like poor connectivity. I read it more of like, there's a centralized office, data, pe the data people are in one place, right, trying to manage this thing that is being, that is supporting production lines that are all over the place. So they want the easiest way to kind of manage something that is being deployed for data across like multiple locations. So to me, again, that was why I chose the bottom one because of like the idea of using a managed service. I didn't, so I didn't read it as much of like, oh, it's like has poor connectivity. I read it of like, oh, it's supporting factories all over the place. Well, and also, to, to reinforce what you're saying is in the bottom solution, you would have all the PLSQL code would be in one place, right? Versus mm -hmm. in the top one, if you put Anthos everywhere at every, you know, every remote place would have its, have a copy yeah. of PLSQL that you'd have to maintain. Yeah. Well, uh, so in my, whoever doesn't know Anthos, uh -huh. uh, it's, it's essentially, a GCP protruding into your on-premise system. And so yeah. you can run the same things what you run on the the cloud GCP on your on-premise. And so I said to myself that, I mean, yeah. this would still make probably uh, easier. I mean, I admit that the, the pure GCP is the, the best, but... Yeah. Uh, Anthos, with Anthos, you might need to like deploy, but you could have the same code. And uh, okay, well, I mean, I'm not sure if that's. Uh, yeah, we should know the the details of the the existing so, system because maybe that's also the eh. the, the other thing. You have to consider that when you go for the exam, because I took many exams and some of them <laughs> I failed and some of them I passed. <laughs> So you have to keep in mind that always go for Google products and the ones that are the best ones. So yes, Anthos is always a Google product, but uh, do you see there you have GCP? So I guess you should go for the GCP, you know what I mean? Yeah, that's a factor as well. Uh, by the way, just uh, I think Anthos is now called uh, GKE Enterprise. I yeah. think that I think the Anthos mm -hmm. name itself has been has been rebranded. So just yeah, in case you run across that. But it's good that you practice with these questions because at the <laughs> exam they are all confusing like this. So if you get used yeah, to this, yeah, exactly, then you know, exactly. Easier. Well, it's like that. a little after seven thirty. I think we have two more. I'm I'm willing to go uh, do all five of them. So let's keep going um let's see okay i'm gonna give two minutes for this one
see how we did here. Mm -hmm. um, anybody want to walk through this one? Never uh, heard it, about this stream CDC, so I was wondering. Yeah, so, so. <laughs> it has to do with the continuous, so it's a continuous load, yeah. right? It's an active app, so it's continuous. So it's like a high, the database, yeah, it's a highly the database important. backup one, yeah, the database backup yeah. export, but that won't work because that's more like for batch. So then um, <laughs> the DMS Correct. only yeah. supports continuous for certain source databases. Um, so, so for me, so again, this, I, I feel like this is one of those questions where the scenario matters. So this is a mm -hmm. uh, hospital patient monitoring app. So you can't have uh, breaks in, in data. Yeah, so it's, mission, it's so, a mission so this critical. This is one of those things where you can't have downtime. Exactly, right. mission critical and continuous. Mission critical. So the right. ex to 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 ex so so backup, export, and restore. You're gonna you're gonna have breaking data. So exactly, that's that's that's, uh, out. that's no good. DMS is kind of like the same thing. So uh, it comes down to those two. So the only reason, the only reason I uh, I went with the 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 stream is because in the in the course one of the one of the one of the um one of the videos one of the lecture videos they talk about because in for for data migration um they talk about uh google partners that that have various tools that um to help support like different migration strategies and streams uh change data capture was one of them so i recognize the name and we and we did a. Uh, I think there was a lab that used Stream. Am I remembering that right? I don't remember. I, I, I did the lab. I didn't. I didn't do I any did, of the labs. I did, I did I the labs a year ago, actually. So I just listened to the lectures. Uh, I'm going from memory, but yeah, definitely Stream is a partner, as you say, and I yeah, think there's, so a, there's a lab for it. And with what Linda was mentioning earlier about you know the answers, if you know if if you're unsure, you know it doesn't. It, if you if you really don't know it you know it doesn't hurt to go with the the one that says google or gc so, so and, the way i the way i looked at it, it was i narrowed it down to the two that have continuous and continuous nature so that either meant stream cdc because um change data capture is exactly that it's it's keeping you current with as as new transactions flow into the source the change the cdc will replicate those to the target and that's a continuous process so but what do, what does it mean by in the number two what does it mean by continuous job is that so uh, i think the their continuous job is more is a bit like the the I, the way i interpret it is is kind of like cdc except it, it sounds more like like a like a like a custom script Home, custom coded home script rather than an actual okay. solution. Okay. To me, that's what it sounded like, right? So, okay. And and because yeah. I recognize Stream and you know, being it being mentioned as a partner of Google, um, it it's it, it's also considered a Google solution. And another factor in these scenario-based questions is usually if there is a choice between a homegrown process that has a lot of manual steps in it yes. versus a managed service that does the same thing the exam is you probably should be leaning towards the managed service yeah yeah if, um, if, yeah. yeah if if you don't know if you have to if you have to yeah. pick between two you go for the one that's um, a, a managed uh, service yes that's a, that's a that's a good good uh, good tip too but yeah, yeah. so that's, okay that's, great well, uh, let's do the last one. I think that's the last one coming up. So uh, I'll start two minutes on this one.
This one's a little tricky too. <laughs> Okay, the Google you, answer. Baby. Go ahead. Baby. Go ahead. <laughs> Go ahead. <laughs> We're not doing too well in these. <laughs> so let's let's look for keywords in the in the question. Uh, transactional that tells you right away something. Um, acid transactions is important. Globally mm -hmm. distributed is important. Mm -hmm. Real-time access for different analytical purposes and to feed different reporting tools. That's I tricky. Think... Well, I don't know. Yeah, so it, it definitely tripped me up. I went away from the BigQuery one because it's transactional. But then it's tricky because they do talk about analytical purposes <laughs> exactly but, exactly but yeah typically when i think real time like continuously generated like cdc real time transactional i'm more moving into like you're moving away from bigquery at that exactly point. yes yeah. exactly yeah yeah but that but it it's tricky because they do say it's for analytical purposes which would yeah, but you can do, you can do like yeah. row based. Yeah, there's exactly. definitely like row based transactional so analytics. It's a question of I think scale. is more what they're talking about. It's a question of scale yeah. at that point. Like BigQuery is really, if you have massive data sets like many terabytes, you really have to use BigQuery. But this doesn't say anything about that. It's you can do analytical process. You know, you can do analytical reporting on with my sequel at a smaller scale you just can't go up to many terabytes so i think it, it's definitely a tricky question because it's got factors from both sides but i think overall i think i think like i'm going with jessica transactional acid globally distributed almost got me to thinking spanner, spanner. yeah so that's reasonable also but I got tricked to Spanner. I yeah, got tricked. Spanner. Is but I, I think, but I think three. doing anal like transactional analytics on C on SQL would be easier than Spanner. Yeah. Well, I I, I went with uh, the BigQuery answer, even though BigQuery isn't part of the, uh, uh -huh. the database answer, right? Because yeah. well, I mean, it 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 BigQuery technically is kind of global ish. Um, and if you're going to use it for analytical and for reporting tools, mm -hmm. you know, uh, yeah, it's definitely you can, tricky. A, you can make a case for BigQuery as well. Yeah. Um, but it's not near real time, though, at least yeah. the analytical part. Although, I mean, not analytics. Will... But your your your, uh, your multi region, um, your multi your cross region read replicas isn't necessarily uh good either like it really depends on how cross-region you're talking about if you're talking about global mm -hmm. um if you're talking about global like let's say i don't know like 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 you know us us east to you know, asia because with with sql like when you when you do a write it's gotta it's gotta replicate to all their um read replicas first before the next one can come in in an acid way yeah right so yeah, i think it, you... can, it can either can either be asynchronous or synchronous replication i think you have the option to choose right i i suppose but then you're you're um you're not you don't you're, you, you'll, not you'll have stale you'll have yeah, stale you'll have stale, stale reads data Right? You'll have stale reads. But if yeah, you're exactly. if you're doing the uh, replication to 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 BigQuery, I mean your analyst, your analyst, uh, your reporting yeah. can just work off of that, and your your MySQL can keep on trucking along. But what the question doesn't specify is it says for the global workforce, but it doesn't say where the rights are being. Are, I mean, are all the rights being generated in one place, and then the in the here it, it doesn't matter because whether whether you're really? yeah whether 
well, whether you're doing the, the big query answer or the uh, read replicas, you're still have, you still have the same master for writes. But what if yeah. you had writes, what if you were writing from writers that were all over the world, just so the, the only we, so I, I ruled out um, Cloud Spanner because it's not for analytical. It's not what? It's not for analytical. Well, uh, let, let's. Mm. Um, my, my thinking was that they are not looking for the analytical portion solution, so it's it's going to be a, a separate decision. Your goal with this question is just to provide the data for the analytical solution but i still went with mm -hmm. spanner but uh, that's one reason i ruled out bigquery <laughs> so bigquery is not as real time and it's not general mainstream for this uh, exam in general plus yeah. uh, so so i was deciding between the uh, the read replica and the spanner so the, the other thing for for the other case for not spanner was but by the way i i i one of the things i picked bigquery is because of one but the first time i did this i did the beta so uh bigquery uh -huh. was, was in there but um oh, the other yeah. thing is that the question said the customers has globally distributed yes spanner is global but they just need to access the data so they just need to do reads you don't need to do you don't need to uh do multiple writes you just need okay. multiple reads. Yeah. So your and writes can go in from one place. It doesn't matter. And they just need to do reads. They need just access the data for analytical purposes. Yeah, and I see. See that the read replicas will take off the burden and provide the read uh, stream for the analytics. To other regions, yeah. Could someone explain what is the number four, the multi-master replication i forgot what that means exactly in my sequel does that mean you can write to two different you, you can't write to two masters there's no okay and they cross replicate to each other then no uh, you say that you cannot you can't have you only have one master so what is multi-master replication what does that mean i don't know ah uh, okay is it a real thing or sometimes they put in fake that answers? is to trip you <laughs> yeah i mean i mean we were it doesn't exist you know we had that linda you might remember we had that previously with some of the in the mle workshop we had yeah. that question like do they sometimes put in fake answers and yeah. um definitely we found examples where they were just completely wrong yeah maybe they're they generated by ai <laughs> I don't know, but I, I'm just not clear. Uh, I guess I don't know what multi-master replication means. So either I need to refresh on my MySQL or maybe it's something that does not exist and that therefore would be not the right answer. So, okay. Well, I say even the experts here were stumped by a lot of these questions. And uh, we, <laughs> as a group, I don't think we did super well, but that's how it goes, folks. And uh, I, you know, we don't know what the passing score is on any Google exam. They don't, uh, they used to just give you literally like a pass or fail. That's it with no feedback. Yeah, that's, that's, cool. that's still how it is. It's still pass or fail. It's still how it is because I heard on some of the exams now they give a, a little bit of a breakdown. Like you did better in this area, not as well in this area, but you just took the exam. So uh i'll check right now i usually don't uh so basically this weekend i i took the exam to recertify for the associate engineer and it's only pass or fail so. yeah no, okay. it's, it's only pass or fail it doesn't, it they, doesn't give they don't give you any breakdown only aws uh, azure and oracle because i took even those exams those they it. give you the breakdown not the google they do i thought maybe i'm mistaken but i thought google was beginning to give a breakdown as well but we'll be maybe nice. that's maybe that's only on the uh on, on the newer exams but um recent experience indicates that that's not true so let's just go 
uh, preview for our next two weeks. Uh, slide seven and eight above at the top gave us the learning path overview that we've gone over a few times. Next week's session will be an informal one. We'll explore some of the topics that I introduced last week about different job roles. And I want to show a little demo of um, how you would do data modeling. And um, also, I might um, add in some. One of the questions we had is like, how much SQL do I really need to know for the different job roles and possibly for the exam? So we might we might take that on next week. Uh, the next two lab courses are yeah the next two courses are six, which is about Spanner. Course seven is all about Bigtable. Again, these are lab only. They have like each of them has five or six labs. There are no more video lessons at all in the rest of the learning path here. So by two weeks from now, we hope to have the um, Spanner and Bigtable courses completed. So um, let's go to work on those, and we can have Q and A about those those um, those courses next week. So with that, I want to say thank you to everybody and. Um, just this is the goodbye slide. So um, if you haven't already claimed your badge for participating in the workshops, grab the link. Mm -hmm.